bomb them out. Yes, yes, I had to kill them. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'll start with the session right away. I think everyone's been waiting patiently and the uh, minister's also in a bit of a rush. He's had a very, very heavy day today. And I think it hasn't ended yet. He has to continue this. So to begin with, I'd like to request Mr. Vilayan Subaya, Chairman CI Mission on Atmanirbhar Bharat and Executive Chairman Tube Investments of India Limited, to welcome everybody and give his presentation along with Mr. Sanjeev Krishan, Chairman PwC India, and uh, to make the presentation. So, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome Mr. Piyush Goyal to the second edition of the CII Global Economic Policy Summit uh, and to this special session on measuring Atmanirpata and the way forward. Uh, so your constant engagement with CII has really helped the industry navigate two big crises, COVID and the Russia-Ukraine war. And as we head into another precarious year, we continue to look to you for, you for your support and encouragement to navigate the widely anticipated slowdown in the economy during 2023. The... Uh, uh, And under your lead leadership, not only has the government taken up many new, new initiatives in the domain of trade, investment, and industrial development, but we've also seen India's exports reach an all-time high of uh, USD $675 billion in 2021-22. Further, you've overseen uh, the signing of the fastest ever FTA negotiation globally. You've also been a strong advocate of Atmanirbhata, self-reliance in various sectors, and it is this conviction of yours that has led the Indian industry to confidently tread on this path. To support the Honorable Prime Minister's clarion call for Atmanirbhar Bharat to build a self-reliant India in 2020, CII has also been undertaking several initiatives under the aegis of various committees and councils to facilitate policy and realize this vision. Today's session is a culmination of these efforts as we present the Atmanirbhartha Index. Uh, given that you've got a fairly kind of tight schedule, sir, maybe what we will do is we'll, we'll love, love to get kind of you say, you have you say a few words for the audience here. Um, yeah, welcome, Uday. Kind of, uh, uh, Uday, come on, come on. Come. Speak from here. Yeah, sure. So I just wanted to give a very warm welcome to Piyush Goel. Um, Piyush, you got so many ministries under you. So I wonder which, which hat of yours you would like to cover. But for me, the ministry which comes from my roots, which is the closest to me, and which you are now in charge of, is the textile ministry, which is because uh, our family has had long tradition with cotton and textiles. And it's something which I think you've taken charge with a great amount of passion and rigor. I'm also aware about the huge responsibility on you with commerce and industry with you. And therefore, uh, the question at this point of time is um, uh, India's, I mean, one of the biggest themes which is being discussed uh, at all uh, places is resilience and sustainability of countries through thick and thin. Um, and in that context, India's positioning, uh, the whole question of trade agreements which have been on your mind. We are um, wanting to get a sense from you. How are you thinking about it? We keep on reading different countries, including the Prime Minister of the UK talking about wanting to do a trade deal with India. So if you've got any color, I believe you've been talking to some other countries today, which has kept you very busy today with a specific country, which... Uh, gives us an opportunity into the European Union. Um, and in that context, uh, uh, how does India also, if there is a global slowdown, how does India combat the whole area of trade and current account um, in the context of what's happening around the world? Even if India is strong, the risk of global trade slowdown, and how do we withstand that and actually 
take it forward. And then, of course, you've got the whole area of consumer affairs, which also is with you. And therefore, you have to wear the other side of the hat, which at times is inflation. So how do you protect consumers from not having the pain of inflation, which has been high? And of course, Indian inflation is much lower than the, the developed world, which is, I mean, at Europe at close to double digit, US at seven and a half, eight, and India being lower, but still high from an Indian point of view. Therefore, as you look at your multifaceted uh, ministries, um, the area of competitiveness, the area of growth, the area of trade agreements, the area of inflation to protect consumers, and through all that, an Atma Nirbhar Bharat, which we are building on a strong position. India is in a very good relative position today in the world. Therefore, of course, we want to take advantage of it. But I'm sure we are thinking about in this context, all the good things that can happen to us, but how are we going to manage the risks also in this very, very fragile world which we are getting into into 2023. And with that, uh, we are really looking forward to Minister Puyush Goel to share with us his thoughts at this crucial juncture for India. Thank you very much, Udebhai, for your very crisp and incisive comments, which give a lot of food for thought. Thank you, Mr. Velayan, for organizing this uh, important economic summit with a focus on Atma Nirbhata. Thank you, Sanjeev, for your leadership of PwC and for all the effort you've put in to put together the story of India's journey of self-reliance, all the distinguished participants, Chandrajit Banerjee, somebody I've often called as the ambassador to the world of Indian industry, and who really is a pillar of strength when we are doing any policy making or when we are working on any strategies for the future. We know that we can always bank on CII and therefore, it's very appropriate that you become the partner for the B20 as India enters into the presidency of G20 this month. Friends, uh, Atma Nirbhar Bharat is a story that started in some sense maybe a few hundred years ago. We lost the way along the last 100, 150 years. But we are getting back to the brass tags, more particularly post the pandemic, COVID pandemic, when we realized that uh, dependence on supply chains, particularly when a large part of our dependence comes through geographies which are not necessarily friendly, which are not transparent or rules-based, can be at great risk for the country. The pandemic also opened our eyes to a number of risk factors in our trading systems, in our manufacturing systems, in, our, in the technology gaps that existed in India, particularly on very critical components of different ecosystems. It could be the auto industry, automobile industry, which went through hell for nearly a year, even after the COVID pandemic recovery started whether it's uh, our vulnerability on the shipping front to the concentration of shipping power in the few countries and a few hands, whether it's our vulnerability on food grains or edible oils, the entire food chain, particularly pulses and edible oil, and in some respect also on other crops like cotton and rubber, a lot of things have come to the fore, which have helped us reshape India's economic thinking, our plans for the next decade, two decades, and now we are looking at a holistic vision for India at 100, India at 2047, which we will celebrate 25 years from now. I think uh, 
from a period where we used to set agendas and set policy for short periods of time, sometimes knee-jerk reactions, sometimes a year or two, oftentimes a five-year plan. We've now come to realize that countries and economies will have to plan for the long haul. And plans will have to be drawn up to really prepare the nation for longer periods like 25 years and 50 years. And that is how we'll be able to really get our act together and prepare the nation to meet the needs of a 1.4 billion people and the demands to make India a developed economy require a lot of collective effort of different sectors, different segments of society, which I see happening before my very eyes today when I engage with people of different walks of life. He could be a producer or manufacturer, he could be a service provider, he could be a small scale or MSME industry, he could be a, just a trader or a retail store owner. I think everybody has collectively decided that we want to see India as a developed country, as a prosperous country. And as they say, once the entire uni universe, once all of us agree that we want to achieve something, the entire universe will conspire to help us to achieve that. And I'm glad that CIA has taken a lead in building that vision story and building the pathway to an Atmanirbhar Bharat, to a self-reliant India. Odebhai has been uh, a great friend and a person who has always given us very good guidance in the journey of India's uh, economy, India's growth. Mr. Velayan, of course, in the manufacturing side has done India proud with this group of companies making all sorts of very high quality products, both for India and internationally and yet consistently remaining rooted to traditional values and high integrity at the core of their working. Same, of course, I would say for Udebhai. And with PwC and its presence in India, it becomes a natural connect with the rest of the world. And we recognize that we can't live in isolation. We can't be living in a closed loop in India. We all recognize that India will have to engage much more and look at deeper engagement with global economy if we want to become a developed nation. And therefore, when we talk of Atmanirbhar Bharat or self-reliant India, we're not looking at closing our doors to international engagement. In fact, I have said it on more than one occasion that we are actually looking at opening our doors wider to international competition and in the world economy. Because that's the only way we'll be efficient, we'll be able to provide goods and services at affordable prices, both to Indian consumers and to the rest of the world. And that's the only way the country will innovate and grow. Progress cannot be in a closed loop, in a closed economy. And clearly, automobile sector is one sector and you are a large player there. Uh, which saw a whole period of protectionism with very little growth and very little innovation or modern technology coming to India and all of us being forced as consumers to depend on long waiting lists only to get a product which was not necessarily contemporary. Similarly, on the banking and finance side, who could have imagined a developing nation like India Today, turn around 6.8 billion digital financial transactions in the month of October 22 alone. So effectively, the current year will probably be twice as big or maybe one and a half times as big as last year when we did 48 billion financial transactions using the UPI system. Probably the largest amount of financial transactions more than the US and Europe put together. Possibly even US, Europe and China put together. I don't know, the statistics would be available with one of you. But it shows the power of India. You could, you could actually go to a village today and you'll find a 
QR code or a, or a guy with a mobile phone ready to accept or make his payment. Digitally, in less than a minute, seamlessly, comfortably, safely, securely. That's been the level of penetration of technology in the country. And I'm taking this example only to highlight to you that when India is planning the next 25 year journey or when we are build, preparing the building blocks on which Prime Minister Narendra Modi has been focused for the last eight years, we are very closely looking at inclusive growth. We are looking at growth being democratized, being socialized through the length and breadth of the country so that no man or no family is left behind. We want prosperity to flow to 1.4 billion Indians. And therefore, all our plans have at the core the sustainable development goals that were finalized several years ago. And for us, the SDGs are not a, not a target we have to achieve by 2030, which was what was agreed by all the countries in the world. For us, we wish to provide those facilities, meet those SDGs much, much faster. Maybe yesterday, hopefully today, but no later than tomorrow. And I hope somebody will not take it literally. But it's only the sense of urgency that I'm trying to highlight here. Take Electricity, for example. We didn't wait for 2030. Soon as Prime Minister Modi took office, having successfully given everybody power 24 by 7 through the length and breadth of Gujarat in his early days in government there, and having seen the transformational impact that, had, that it had on people's lives, that was one of the earliest programs it took up. And it continues to power the Gujarat economy, the lives of the people of Gujarat, very appropriately reflected in today's results when I think history has been created with the highest number of seats ever any party has won in Gujarat. It's only an endorsement of his pro-poor and pro-people policies. The fact that Prime Minister Modi, whether in Gujarat for the first uh, early part of his uh, uh, administrative years in government, the 12 and a half years he spent there, or the eight and a half years he spent in Delhi at the helm of affairs of the country has been completely focused, literally 24 by 7, with a single-minded purpose to impact the lives of every person, particularly the marginalized sections of society, those who have been left behind, those who have been discriminated against, those who could not possibly board a train like maybe one of the other of our family members did one or two generations back, which has brought us to this privilege that we are all in this room here today. And in that building of the basic blocks, Prime Minister Modi recognizes that it is important to focus on A, of course, taking prosperity to the people, but good governance is going to be equally important. It's going to be equally important to build sustainable and modern infrastructure in the country. It's going to be very important to build talent, pools of talent, pools of educated, highly qualified, smart children, but with the ability to pursue the career of their choice not necessarily drawn into the typical rut of graduation and uh, studies the way they were all these years, for which we brought out the National Education Policy 2020, which allows liberal education to flow, which allows people to pursue a vocation of their choice, which focuses on skill development, which focuses on giving people an opportunity to explore their own talent the way they like to, so that we don't land up becoming a nation of three idiots and a person who wants to do photography being forced to do engineering. Or 
children being forced to do rote learning so that a definition of a machine is more important than the working of the machine itself and therefore our work of the eight and a half years while having the overlay of preparing india to engage with the world with an open door policy also has reflected on building domestic strengths and that's a big departure from the past we have had free trade agreements in the past we've had international engagement in the past but industry was left to find its own moorings industry was never given the hand holding support that should concurrently come to help industry in the initial years at least to build that base to be able to compete so you don't open your economy to the rest of the world without first preparing your domestic economy to face the challenges of the world and in some sense i believe that is that was lacking in the period when we started our international engagement or we opened up to international engagement in the earlier years otherwise uh, probably we would not have been dependent so much on very basic capital goods for example on very basic auto components very basic intermediate products like chemicals and steel and apis or ksms for the pharma sector on the rest of the world we would have been a strong superpower here also when the api ecosystem was all going to a neighboring country in the north government would have woken up to that reality and protected our technologies so that we don't become super dependent on other countries not to say by artificial barriers or stopping competition but by strengthening the domestic ecosystem and i'm happy to share with you that the production linked incentive scheme and i'm certain that all of you are well aware of that is designed to support domestic industry wherever it requires that support in the initial years and mind you this is not a scheme that originated from government we only played the role of a hand holding support system the commerce and industry ministry set up the scale committee during covid when prime minister modi gave the first clarion call for atmanirbhar bharat cbi has been a part of that journey through and through the scale committee and scale stands for steering committee for advancement of localization and e had two or three connotations we allowed all of them to play a role export or export competitiveness employment and efficiency because ultimately no government and no program really can sustain for a long period of time on government sops or government handholding you can just give a kick start to the hamara bajaj scooter unfortunately sanjeev is not here with us you can only give a kick start to the scooter then it has to run on its own little bit of efficient petrol consumption or now efficient electric consumption but that kick start is what the pli is trying to do even in your yacht you have a yacht i think you don't so no trappings of being a rich man is here even in a yacht or a let's say a boat a fishing trawler you have to pull that string to give it that initial traction it's your field really i am a poor little chartered accountant like uday and uh, sanjeev it's more velian's uh, job to explain this that's what we are doing just want to give that kick start to the process and the, end, the we only form the committee committee comprised of totally private sector people led by pavan goenka of mahindras all the stakeholders were the associations like cii fiki and asochem phd chamber and others our secretaries joint secretaries officials were available on call they were av available to do the running around if required they were available to do any studies or any 
data compilation of statistics or to open the doors to this committee for whatever information it required. And that's where the PLI scheme germinated. And I must tell you what a remarkable job the scale committee did. How they dissected sector by sector. First 12 sectors. There are another 12. And I think they're currently working on a few more ideas which will help us come up with more PLI schemes. Some are already on the way. All of it designed in consultation with industry. In my own experience is that this is one scheme that has found traction and acceptance across the board, across the country. People have welcomed it. We've seen good traction, good investments coming in. There's some mistaken impression that some news reports suggested that uh, the scheme is not going as fast as it was proposed to go or the investments are not as were slated to be. I think that came out of a misunderstanding where somebody picked up the targets of five years hence or seven years hence or the targets of investments over the three-year gestation period at the end date and saw the current achievement and said, oh, we are very much behind. But it's a whole process. You don't get investments overnight. It takes time to set up a factory manufacturing unit and then start building up customer base and production. So when you look at it from the context of the pathway or the journey to implement PLI, we are well on track and I must compliment Indian industry for their humongous and wonderful work all of you are doing in respect of using PLI to kickstart investments and domestic manufacturing. Odebai, you talked about textiles. Uh, must thank your father, Suresh Bhai Kotak, a doyen of the textile industry, uh, who is helping me in my own little efforts to try and rejuvenate the cotton sector. It's a sector where we used to be probably the best in the world once upon a time. And we are left to probably a market share of 3 or 4% of global trade. We are hoping to revitalize that sector. We are working actively to improve productivity right from cotton at the farmer's level, where agriculture and we are working together, right up to export. The famous five that uh, Prime Minister Modi articulated, farm to fiber to fabric to fashion to foreign. You remember the famous five books we used to read, Enid Blyton? Similarly, technical textiles today has two-thirds of the share of global trade in textiles. India was non-existent. Having recognized that, more particularly, when COVID hit us, we didn't have any PPE manufacturing in India. All of it was imported, the personal protective equipment. We didn't have rapid testing kits. We could have run short of masks and syringes and all of that. India quickly ramped up. All of you played a huge role. We are the second largest manufacturers of PPEs in the world today. We are exporting it from India. No shortage of any product during COVID. Any medical product. All of it thanks to the work that Indian industry did. And now we have a national technical textile mission. It's been working for a few years now, a couple of years, three years, where we are promoting also innovation, research and development. We have over 200 projects, truly in the spirit of government financing it, a private player proposing it or working in tandem with an educational institute. So academia, private sector and government, all working in tandem, something which I thought you would always advise us in every engagement we had with industry associations or businesses that all have to come together so that we can truly get innovation R&D into India. We're trying to do that. I have still a lot of budget. May I appeal to those of you and through you to all those interested in technical textiles. We still have huge budgets. Please come up with new proposals, new ideas, areas where we don't have technology in India on technical textiles, geotextiles, Machinery required to manufacture technical textiles. We are happy to support any innovation, any research. And it's largely government funded. The private sector supports in terms of the practical utilization and use. The academic institution can help in the uh, research part of it. So we, 
I'm just giving you a flavor of how we are thinking. We are literally dissecting global trade and preparing India item by item, product by product, to see how we can engage with the world. For example, I must share with you, when we are doing FTA negotiations, the amount of stakeholder consultations this government has, I dare say has never been done before. It was consultations with all of you that helped Prime Minister Modi. The feedback that we got from your consultation, which I shared with him, and of course the details of the RCEP, which helped us walk out of RCEP. It's equally important to recognize your responsibility not to do a free trade agreement. If it is not in national interest, not in the interest of our business, and not in the public interest. And walking out was in national interest. More so, because we already had FTA with 10 of the ASEAN countries. We had an FTA with Japan and Korea. Australia was a low-hanging fruit. We've proven that. 29 December, India-Australia ITA agreement, a unity agreement as it was called in Australia, Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement comes into force on 29 December. So two important FTAs with two large trading partners of India within 12 months, within a calendar year. And mind you, and I'm reminding you this because I want you to reflect on all the criticism that you hear about the Japanese FTA, the Korean FTA, how it was unfair, unequal, how in the ASEAN FTA, Indian industry got a raw deal. So we have products where we want to export to the ASEAN countries, but we are blocked and which are merrily coming in at zero or low duties thanks to those FTAs because stakeholder consultation was weak. And look at UAE and Australia. Have you heard of a single negative comment? Anybody in this room, any sector, any industry, any businessman, any company, any editorial which found a single flaw in the Australia or UAE FTAs. That's the way this government thinks and works in terms of engagement. And the textile sector is clearly a sector of focus. We have a plan to increase our exports from 43 billion last year. We set this target when we were 33 billion. And CB knows I like to put exponential targets. So when we were 33, I'd said we should be 100 billion in six years, if I remember correctly. So we are one year in at 43. I hope the trend will continue and we reach 100 billion of exports of textiles in six years. Similarly, our overall economic value add on textiles is targeted at 250 billion. Same period, doubling it. And I'm confident we will with the support of friends from the textile sector like your dad. Sustainability is a story where we are far ahead of everybody else in the world. We are amongst the only countries which even reports once in two years to the UNFCCC about our achievements. And mind you, we are ahead of target on almost every score. Our density, our, uh, our GDP, uh, our, our uh, contribution to uh, pollution as a percentage of our GDP or in relation to our GDP is amongst the lowest in the world. Our per capita uh, Emissions are amongst the lowest in the world. And we are continuously improving on that. Our GDP intensity of emissions is reducing faster than what we had committed in Paris. We had committed to be 40% of installed capacity clean energy by 2030. We are 42% as we speak, eight years ahead of schedule. And now Prime Minister has put a target of 500 gigawatt, which means you guys need to consume more electricity because the base load or the transmission lines have a limitation to how much clean energy they can take in. So unless you consume a thousand gigawatts or more, we can't have 500 gigawatt of clean energy. Which means there's an economic imperative on all of us to grow. And just simple maths, simple economic statistics tell me that 25 years from now in this Amrit Kal, we will be a 32 to 35 trillion dollar economy in a business as usual case. Given the foundation that we are creating of a strong economy, the fundamentals of a strong economy, the fact that our focus on infrastructure and logistics costs is so deep, we should actually be aspiring for a 40 trillion dollar plus economy. 
in 2047. Very much doable. I think CII report also says that. They talk of 45 actually. 40 plus. 40 plus yeah. At a startup uh, engagement with the Startup Advisory Council in Bangalore um, two weeks or three weeks ago, an investor said, Sir, with all that we have heard from you, at 2047, India should be a $47 trillion. <laughs> that was music to my ears. And mind you, six months ago when I spoke about a $30 trillion economy in India, at that time I was talking of 30 years. I've advanced that with more and more data points coming in to 2047, 25 years. But when I said 30 trillion, I had a lot of backlash and trolling on social media out there. Particularly one channel which is very inimical to us was doing hammer and tongs, writing articles, making fun of me. The 30 trillion dollar economy ki baat. And I still remember the same young man who's standing there sending me a note in Tirupur since you talked of textiles. I was addressing textile industry in Tirupur one day, one afternoon. And he sent me a note while I was speaking just like this note. That you're being trolled badly on social media for the 30 trillion dollar remark. You may like to explain what you mean, how you calculate it. And I spent 10 minutes running the maths like a professor would do probably. Or PwC would do with their fancy, beautiful presentations. And I can, if uh, time doesn't permit it now, but anybody has any doubts, I can happy, I'm happy to deconstruct this number. And you'll see that I'm being very conservative. So let's go bold. There is a global slowdown, global trade slowdown. It's not if there is, there is one. It is true that economies which had 1 or 2% inflation are at double digit. And we, and I'm sure many of you track the economy or if you go buying, shopping anywhere, you remember those days where 10-12% inflation was a given in India. A former prime minister of the grand old party is on record to say inflation is good for the country. We want more inflation to grow. Hoping that the people will live in the uh, illusion that oh, our incomes are growing, our uh, economy is growing in nominal terms, L not recognizing that people are smart. One of our campaign slogans in 2014 was, janta sab hai. And in that situation, certainly we'll have a stress. So we can't have the kind of growth story year on year at the same level. But despite that, I suspect a 7% Growth in real terms this year is going to happen. And in terms of uh, dollar terms, with a six odd percent inflation or six and a half, seven percent inflation, uh, even though rupee has depreciated a little inordinately this year, I still believe our dollar term economy will cross three and a half trillion. And I do believe by 2026, 20, 27, we'll clearly be the third largest economy in the world. Undoubtedly. No power on earth can stop this from happening. Similarly, I recognize that even at 6.8%, we are conscious that we have to control inflation. Reserve Bank is taking their steps. We in government. It's for the first time that both are working in tandem fiscal and monetary policy. So whether it was recalibrating our import duties, whether it was opening up to imports on products where prices are higher, or stopping export of goods where we needed to conserve domestic production, we've taken proactive measures. And it's evident in the numbers. You saw the October number, CPI fall from 7.4 to 6.8. Hopefully the November number will be even better. And we'll soon get down into the 4 plus minus 2% band. Very, very confident of that. And as Consumer Affairs Minister, I'm also conscious while on the one hand, inflation. On the other hand, availability of goods and services at affordable prices. So I don't know whether it is by design but I know that Prime Minister Modi does everything to design. That he has kept these three portfolios. Commerce and industry. Textile, the second largest employer after agriculture. And consumer affairs and food and public distribution together. Because I have to balance in every negotiation. 
business interests with consumer interests. So if Velayan wants me to stop the import of a certain product to protect his industry, I have to balance it also with my consumer's interests so I don't make him pay too much more. So it's a very delicate balance between trade, commerce and industry, business and consumer interests. And that's what, friends, I'm trying to do as we all collectively work towards uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat, towards making India an uh, economic superpower, but recognizing that growth has to be inclusive, growth has to be democratic, growth has to reach the last man at the bottom of the pyramid, growth has to care for a better life for 1.4 billion people, that growth has to reach the remotest nook and corner of the country. That growth should take everybody along, inclusive growth. And with the overlay of sustainability, growth has to be conscious of its responsibilities, both to the people of India and as a responsible global citizen to the world, so that we don't land up in a situation where the entire world reaches a stage of collapse. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And I'll continue to work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, due to the paucity of time, I don't know how much we can explain to you, sir, about the measuring of Atma Nirbhata, but I'd request Mr. Vilayan if you can do it in two minutes and we can do the, have him do the honors of releasing the report. Two minutes, that's all you have. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so um, you know, we just give you a very um, brief uh, uh, brief e explanation of kind of what we've done. Basically, uh, I, I think we can get there just at one slide with kind of the Atman Nirbhata index on there. I think that'd be useful. So uh, really, so what we've done is kind of try to uh, create a way. One of the things that the CIA Atman Nirbhata mission has been mulling on for a couple of years is to the thought of an index that will be, you know, what we call simple, monitorable, measurable, that allows the country to really determine whether it has achieved Atman Nirbhata or not. Um, and uh, effectively, what we've done is come up with an index that looks at the ratio of exports to imports. And it's also looked at, um, um, it's also looked at uh, how other countries have kind of tracked. So the interesting thing with the index is it can be done at an aggregate level at the country level. So currently India is at 0.69. And uh, we've actually set a potential trajectory that, you know, we could kind of, if India says that they would like to achieve Atmanirbhata by X year, what does that trajectory mean? Uh, and perhaps we can just, uh, yeah, and actually what's interesting is if you look at how other countries have tracked, maybe we can just kind of jump to the uh, Korea slide. Um, and we've got... Um, it's actually fascinating the journey that they have taken from 1960 when they were at 0.22 on Atmanir Bharta to achieving uh, an index of 1.11 over that time period. Uh, it's actually a staggering journey and uh, a lot of what, you know, how they did it is kind of, you know, actually kind of fairly interesting as well. The other thing that's interesting with the index, if we can just jump back to the bubble slide, is uh, it actually talks through uh, how different it, it can be measured at an aggregate level, but also at an at a specific industry level, right? So you can look at what's happening with the indiv individual industries that are closer to kind of achieving it, and how each of the industries can kind of actually improve over time. Uh, we've also got specific case examples. We just jumped to China and kind of an electronics about how China systematically had a combination of uh, company policy, country policy that allowed them to move from 0.67, uh, which is what they were at 2002, to 1.17 by 2015. In 13 years, they moved from 0.67. So country, uh, India today is at 0.69, and kind of, you know, basically, you know, they moved the index. And in that time, the size of exports went from 31 billion to 412 billion, just in a 13-year period. And it's a combination, obviously, of policy, government, and kind of industry initiatives, kind of, uh, that we've kind of uh, got into. So really, basically, you know, the idea was kind of how do we use this index? It's, a, it's something that can be measurable, you know, kind of, you know, uh, it can be measured at an individual account code level. And we can just go forward to the, uh, to the last slide. Um, 
And uh, so we can really look at kind of how the country can actually measure. Uh, so this is kind of a simple Atmanirpata dashboard that we could set up by business. Uh, it can be kind of uh, publicly monitored and each industry could basically look at the progress kind of that, that that industry is kind of making and we can set specific targets to it. Uh, with the culmination of this idea of uh, the last slide, perhaps, uh, that, you know, India could kind of, you know, like you said, sir, about setting aggressive targets. We thought of, you know, Atman Rupata, we started in 2012. May I just make Please. a question. Mm. I think uh, you are taking export, import figures and preparing it. Would it not be more appropriate to see import divided by the value of production? That mm. way which would give you the dependence on international market and assuming that the rest is your domestic production. Or you can actually do total value produced. Uh, yeah, it will cover, exports yeah. will get automatically covered in that minus yeah. or uh, divided yeah. by the, uh, the Wait. imports divided by the total value. Yeah. Go ahead, Sanjeev, uh, please. You know, I think this can have many iterations. Uh, we debated this. Mm. I think the idea was to start with the with the index, which is simple and easy to comprehend. And I, I'm sure we'll continue to build on this. But but yes, you're right. I mean, you know, we can look at various ways to. Mm. I, I I mean, I, you continue. Yeah. But I must say, I compliment CII for this initiative, because unfortunately, we in India depend only on foreign companies or foreign. Uh, think tanks or foreign organizations preparing indexes on our data Absolutely. or on our country, Absolutely. bashing us for no rhyme or reason. Yeah. Very often useless bashing we get. I mean, the hunger index. What a crazy thing. There's not a single guy in India probably who dies of starvation today. Particularly after the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan and Yojana. Right. Most people tell me and my own wife tells me that you, a human being can't probably have 10 kilos of uh, grain and uh, food grains in a month, the quantity that's being given. Idea is that we are just getting bashed for lack of proper understanding and data indices being prepared fairly. Similarly on let's say stunting and uh, stunting and whatever weight. Growth. Mm -hmm. Now Indian body is different from a Norwegian Absolutely. body or somebody coming from Sweden and meeting me yeah. today, right? We should prepare our indexes, indices Relevant based on our yeah. real ground level situation. Yeah. What yeah. we, what is our average height in India? Yeah. And from there decide what is the level of stunting, if at all. In. Because the numbers I read in terms of the number of people that this index has found to be stunted or mm. malnourished and all are crazy. Yeah. Difficult to imagine that this is the situation. And I go into interiors of India, as do many of you. We go to the villages, we see the levels of prosperity now, reaching the farmers, the small entrepreneurs, traders, villages. I think India is a different story. Today. Absolutely. Yeah. And with our purchasing power parity also factor. Remember, we are a $3.3 trillion economy. But on a purchasing power parity, we may be $10 trillion yeah. against $3.3 mm -hmm. trillion. So when you factor all of that in and see the real situation on the ground, I wish CII and others, and maybe you can also help from industry. Some of you all come together, put a pool of resources, get some think tanks to do some indices, which are India-centric, based on India's needs and requirements. One point. And second, and I heard this on a mission board, so that we junk those reports and we have our own indices. And on a second point, which I should have mentioned there, Indian industry needs to support each other. There are many times we can get a glass in the hotel industry which could be Indian. You can import it also. Just because we believe that an imported product is good, maybe in ceramics or in glass or in furniture, we'll end up importing. I think all of us collectively have a duty to the nation because every single product instead of importing you buy domestic, you are putting money into the hands of somebody who deserves it you are adding to the income of a poor person. You are maybe helping a handicraft or a handloom person or a khadi person. And I hope every child, I, the only person who was wanting to clap on this was this young sister of mine. I compliment you better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
because that spirit has to be brought in. What Prime Minister said, it's a duty of every Indian to make India a developed nation. Hum sabka kartavya. I think that spirit, if even industry has, it can have a game changing impact on our country. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. With that, we'd just like you to kind of quickly inaugurate the report. And this is the report on the measuring Atman Nirbharta done at the CII and request you to kindly do it. And with that, sir, we come to the end of this uh, session. Thank you very much for your time. And we know how tight for time you are today. And thank you, however, for finding time for us. I said, I'll go late there, but the subject is very good. Yeah. Thank you.